So, a sophomore nursing student at Pitt calls her father sometimes 5.30 in the morning and she'll say, Dad, look this up for me. And he said, oh, why don't you look it up? And she said, I can't find this stuff. Well, what's important about that is that when she went to school, she did everything that the school needed for her to do for the school. She took the PSSA test and she scored proficient. But somewhere along the line, she didn't get the tools that she needed in order to be uh, a self-directed, self-sustaining type learner afterwards. That's one of the side effects of No Child Left Behind. Uh, the punitive nature of that law forced a lot of the schools to sort of shift the focus 180 degrees, where once it used to be uh, what we can do for the students, suddenly it became about what they have to do for us. And if you don't believe that, uh, talk to someone who missed AYP two years in a row, and, and you get a real sense then of how things change. Had No Child Left Behind happened in the 80s or even in the 90s, it might not have been such, a, uh, such an issue. But it was signed into law in 2001, and it happened to coincide with the greatest, almost impossible evolution that took place online. And it's forcing some schools to, uh, to miss it. So what I'd like to do is to put this in perspective. I want to look at, at just the last six years of that evolution and then project forward a little bit to give us some context. Six years ago, YouTube launched. I, can't, I don't remember life before YouTube, uh, uh, but there, I had a lot of life before YouTube, but I don't remember much of it. It seems like it's been around for a long time. It's changed cultures, all the, the wealth of content that's on YouTube. Also, six years ago, a site called Wikispaces was launched. Wikis are websites that have as many pages as you want, and if you want a new page, you click a link that says New Page. If you want to put something on that page, you click a, the Edit button, you type, you save. It's that easy. It's so easy that second and third grade students can get together and construct knowledge together. Kids from all over the world can get together and, and construct knowledge together, as witnessed by the um, Flat Classroom projects. So finally, we have a tool now that really does facilitate true collaboration at a very, very um, easy level. Five years ago, Google put their spreadsheets online. Um, allowed for multiple synchronous editors of spreadsheets. And about that time, Microsoft put their Office apps online. About here is when people started talking about the cloud and, and they weren't talking about the weather. And uh, then five years ago, Twitter. Now, I get that a lot of folks don't get Twitter. But there's no mistaking the fact that Twitter has changed the world. Twitter has, uh, we've seen it, uh, having a role in the overthrow of governments. We, we, we've seen it change television and radio into a two-way medium. And you can connect people from all over the world with Twitter. In fact, you can get on there and you can get uh, free, self-organized professional development on Twitter. You can even talk with people out of this world. It was possible to communicate with the uh, astronauts and, from space and live tweeting, follow them in space, very cool. And in 2006, five years ago, we have uh, Digo. Digo is a social bookmarking site that instead of just bookmarking things on, on our computer, we bookmark it online. But not only that, we can share it. Well, not only that, but we can actually get in and highlight some text on that page and leave sticky notes on that page that can be added to and, and read by other people, maybe just in our class. So it changes the way that we, we work with the vast amount of content that's online. Four years ago, we have um, uh, Google Docs. Google bought a program called Rightly, which is the word processor. Put it together with their spreadsheets, instant Google Docs. And overnight, it changed the kinds of assignments that teachers can give to their students. And the way that kids access their files and the way that they collaborate overnight. This was a huge uh, invention here in just four years ago. The Kindle came and changed forever what we think, how we think about reading, changed the whole culture of reading. And then, just four years ago, the iPhone. Holy cow! 
the iPhone. That's only four years old, and that changed everything. It not only gave us a phone, but it gave us access to the world's information on your belt or in your purse. And the whole context of school changed. And schools have to function in light of that context and not in spite of that context. Three years ago, a neat little invention called the Live Scribe Pen. You, uh, you write in ink on a tablet and talk while you're writing, and it records it all. When you get back and sync it to your computer, it gives you a little video of your writing and your audio synced together. Wow, changes the way kids can take notes and turn in homework. Also, three years ago, a program called Edmodo. It has a sort of a Facebook feel to it, and it changes the way that teachers are extending their classroom walls. Two years ago, maybe the biggest invention of all, Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha is so complicated, it took Stephen Wolfram 13 years and the development of a new science to create this. It, it's not a search engine. It doesn't link you to uh, other websites. Instead, it computes the answer and it shows you the steps and draws the solution. It's an amazing site. If you haven't been there, you have to check it out. And with that one invention, it's no longer possible to have a true-false, multiple-choice, or fill-in-the-blank question that can't be answered now with Wolfram Alpha, a search engine, and the device on your hip. Everything has changed with education. Last year, to sort of cap off that five-year growth spurt there, last year, maybe the biggest invention of all, the iPad. Holy mackerel, we know what that all has changed. That's changed everything. So that's the context. In those five years, now we have tools that will let us do things that we could never do before. We could never facilitate the collaboration that we're able to do, global collaboration now. But No Child Left Behind is still making us you know, get the worksheets out and, and work on memorizing the facts for that test. What about going forward? Well, we don't know what we don't know, of course, but some things we can predict. For example, by 2018, that's hard to say, 2018, in six years, it'll be the iPad 8, and it'll do all the things that this iPad cannot do and things that we can't even imagine. And in six years, it'll be the iPhone 10 and the Droid 10s doing things that we can't even imagine right now. And you've probably, I'm sure you've seen the TEDx video where they talk about the sixth sense technologies. That's right around the corner, people working on that right now. And I think it was Harold Haas was his name, showed how we can get data transmitted through uh, LED light bulbs. That could change how we think about how and where we get internet. And there's this material called e-ink, uh, e-cloth. It's actually cloth that that can display flashing messages. In six years, you'll probably be able to go online, fill in a form, get your own custom-made flashing T-shirt. And overnight, your dress code's going to go right out the window. <laughs> and, and we haven't even begun to talk about the augmented reality. That's, uh, and these are things that we know about. What's the other context that school works in? Well, you know, 12 years ago, we hit six billion people on the planet. By one estimation, by the end of this month, there will be 7 billion people. By 2027, 8 billion. And by 2046, in the lifetime of many of you in this, some of you in this room, uh, <laughs> uh, we will have 9 billion people on the planet. In the United States, we will have gone from 272 million 12 years ago and by the time our first graders are just 40 years old, again in your lifetime, there'll be 405 million people in the United States. And you'll never find a parking place. <laughs> this morning I was looking for the parking garage here, and I, I punched it in on my GPS, and it said none found, and I was thinking, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> But with that, in talking about his book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, Thomas Friedman said, uh, give each one of those folks one light bulb that they burn just four hours a day. Well, let's carry that forward. Let's give them one glass of water, one glass of milk. Let's let them generate one pound of non-biodegradable, non-recyclable garbage a week or even a month, and you get a sense for 
the, the impact that that kind of a population growth is going to have. And the, the pressures and the, uh, on our open space will be profound, and the impact on our communities will be profound, as you're, you in uh, Williamsport are already beginning to see. While that's happening, schools are in the critical and unique position to train and inspire and motivate kids and give them the skills that they need, not just to pass a PSSA test, but to be able to research like that nursing student, find the information they want, because it'll be those kids who will be solving those problems. Well, you've heard, the ex you've heard it said, I'm sure, that uh, uh, we are training kids uh, to solve problems that we don't know yet are problems. Well, as the song says, that don't impress me much. <laughs> Because we've always done that. We've always trained kids to solve problems that we don't yet know are problems. Certainly in 1955, my first grade teacher had no idea that those kids would even see a color television, let alone see a man walk on the moon, or let alone to have a device like the iPhone giving them access to the world's information on their belts. She had no idea of that. I mean, this was Dick Tracy time, you know, there, and his uh, wrist radio. And kids learned from uh, encyclopedias. And those encyclopedias are more than, often than not seen in this context than as uh, in front of students learning, right or wrong. All this happened in, that happened in the last six years, but the last ten years have been incredible. So teachers who began the decade feeling, you know, I can animate a PowerPoint with the best of them, suddenly have found that their tech skills have expired. And going forward, we know that there are some, some things that are just... Uh, that just hold true. And that is that, that some practices that are going on now just... we can't afford them. For example, we must... we must get those tools in the hands of our teachers and our students. You know, if, if your teachers, who, by the way, if you have a master's or a doctorate degree, you're in the top 11%. And if, you, if your teachers don't have access to YouTube for the kids, that's, in my opinion, inexcusable and totally indefensible. And, and I know schools that block Google Docs, that block Wikispaces, that block the blogs and block Wikipedias. Somebody's making that decision in those schools, and I would argue that the students can't afford that kind of thinking. Our communities, faced with all that we're faced with, cannot afford that kind of thinking. And this nation, faced with our crippling debt and all of our problems, uh, cannot afford that kind of thinking. Secondly, if we do give them those tools, it's not about just memorizing the facts. We now can facilitate collaboration. Get them learning how to connect with people, find and solve problems. That's going to be where it's at. Unfortunately, that isn't tested, you know. And what gets tested gets taught, as we know. And thirdly, just saw them off everybody's Christmas card list. Uh, <laughs> the, the notion that, well, if you want me to learn that, you got to pay me. I would argue that nobody can afford that kind of attitude either. Now, this box that I've been unable to open so far is like the Internet. It contains something magical, something that will transform teaching and learning uh, and, and give those kids the skills they need going forward. But you know what? If we waited for me to find it and show it to you, that isn't going to get us there. It's not about, we can't wait for someone else to show it. We need to find within ourselves what this little girl has, oh, what that little girl has. A sense of wonder. The web is full of wondrous things that do change teaching and learning and do inspire and motivate those kids. C.K. Chesterton wrote, we perish for want of wonder, not for want of wonders. And the web is full of wondrous things. So with that, I'll, I'll leave you with something to think about. Thank you very much.